turning though to some of the problems more philosophical, I think, than scientific with many worlds. Maybe the one we should start with is the preferred basis problem, though I think you prefer to just describe it as the ontological problem. Right. So this is very much the question of what justifies this language of worlds. So if, if in a certain sense, I've uh, I've reversed the order here. I, I've given you an explanation of the uh, many worlds theory that sort of builds in my preferred way of thinking about this, um, which is to say that things get structurally uh, equivalent to many worlds. But if you just step back and say, maybe at the microphysical level, the way I want to understand the fact that things can be doing two things at the same time is I want to say they do different things in different worlds. Then you've got a problem like, like how is that justified at all, was the first question. I mean, the theory doesn't, at the fundamental level, say anything about worlds. It just says you know, a particle is doing two things at the same time. And even if you could, um, this gets slightly more technical, even if you could justify the notion of a world at all, at the fundamental level, quantum mechanics lets you divide up physical reality into um, definite properties in a whole bunch of different ways. So, for instance, suppose I've got a particle that is like it's spinning both clockwise and anticlockwise at the same time around the z-axis, say. Well, you could try to describe that as saying, well, there's a world in which it's spinning clockwise around the z-axis, and there's a world in which it's spinning anticlockwise around the z-axis, so there's two worlds. But mathematically, a particle, well, of a certain kind um, that's spinning around the x-axis, around the, sorry, around clockwise and anticlockwise at the same time around the z-axis, could be redescribed as a particle that's spinning clockwise and anticlockwise around the x-axis at the same time. And so now you could start saying, well, now there are two worlds. There's one in which it's spinning clockwise around the x-axis and one in which it's clock spinning anticlockwise around the x-axis. Uh, and those descriptions look incompatible, but nothing in the microscopic formalism will tell you which is right. So the temptation, and people fell into this trap a lot in the 80s, I think, is to say, right, we weren't quite right that the many worlds theory is pure interpretation. We have to add just a little special source to it. We have to add a bit of mathematics that will tell us what the worlds are. Um, and the idea was, you know, that was how you solved the third basis problem. You put some math in that said, these are the worlds. But it became recognized that as soon as you did that, you spoiled the main advantage of the many worlds theory, which is this conservatism I'm talking about. I mean, many... If a multiplicity of Davids is the price you pay for interpreting our best physics there and not having to redo quantum mechanics, then maybe that's a price worth paying. If, you're, if, if you've got a plan to redo the whole of quantum mechanics, and by the way, it also involves a multitude of Davids, that starts to seem a bit absurd. And so, so, so it, it became recognized, I think, that a worthwhile many worlds theory couldn't justify this talk of world by a change of the fundamental equations. And then people started saying that, um, well, maybe there isn't splitting at all. It's just it's an illusion. It appears to us as if they're splitting. Um, so really, uh, there aren't two Davids. There's just one David, but the one David is suffering an, something like an illusion that they're having definite experiences, or, or maybe a different way of putting it is somehow there's one David, but that David has two minds, two sets of conscious perceptions, something like that. And now you're off to some very sketchy philosophy of mind and some, again, some things that seem very off the way we want to do in normal science. Um, and what I think the right way to resolve that is, is to recognize that it's a false dichotomy to suppose that either worlds need to exist in our theory fundamentally or worlds need to be illusions um, and, and not really be there at all. It's perfectly possible for things to exist but not be there fundamentally. So Mars and Earth were my examples earlier. Uh, cats don't exist fundamentally. You don't find cats in the equations of the standard model of particle physics. You and I don't exist fundamentally, but we still exist. We're still perfectly serious, robust bits of physical reality. Why is that? Well, it's because we're emergent as sort of autonomous, self-contained dynamical systems, describable in a relatively robust way. Uh, that's the criterion in science generally for higher order ontology to be present. Uh, if you apply that criterion to the many worlds theory, claim, then you find you get this multiplicity of classical goings on. That, and that's not something that happens microscopically. That goes back to what we were saying earlier. It's something you see when you're at a sufficiently large scale that the physical processes that govern systems like us 
start making it impossible for worlds to kind of overlap and interfere and start allowing them to just evolve and do their own thing separately from one another. Hmm. Can you explicitly bring decoherence in here? Uh, I think, I mean, it's so important. It's worth just getting on the table. And I should say the physical process that tells us that this interference goes away, that we start getting robust um, separate dynamics for these branches is what physicists call decoherence. And what decoherence is as a physical process, it's effectively the dispersal of quantum mechanical information from a relatively small number of particles to a, or degrees of freedom in physics jargon, to a very, very large number of degrees of freedom. You see, to do these interference experiments, the letters tell that there are two things happening at the same time. It's necessary to bring all the degrees of freedom that are doing two things at the same time into a very delicate coexistence. So if my particle has gone left and right at the same time, I've got to do something that brings the particle, that affects the particle's position in just the right way. If that particle interacted with another particle, let's say it bounced off an electron or something, let's say the original particle is a proton, it bounced off an electron. Now I've got proton left, electron left, and proton right, electron right at the same time. And now to do interference effect experiments, I've got to control both the electron and the proton and bring them both together at the same time. If I just do it with the proton, it won't work. You won't see the interference at all. If I just do it with the electron, it won't work. Um, and even with two particles, that's quite a fiddly task. But if you imagine now it's not just a proton, it's a billiard ball. And I've got a billiard ball that's here and there at the same time. Well, zillions of, as a technical term, zillions of atoms in the atmosphere are bouncing off the billiard ball, um, you know, Every, every every millisecond or something. So now, to do the interference experiment with the billiard ball, uh, and to allow, if you like, the billiard ball world, or the billiard ball left world and the billiard ball right world to interfere with one another, now I don't just need to control the billiard ball, I need to control the zillions of air molecules that bounced off the billiard ball. And that's just impossible. It, it's impossible for the same sort of reasons we're familiar in sort of thermal physics, that it's impossible in practice uh, for an ice cube to just spontaneously form in warm water because that would require all of the particles in the warm water to be coordinated in just exactly the right way. So likewise, doing an interference experiment with a billiard ball would require the billiard ball and all the various particles that bounced off it to be coordinated in exactly the right way. That is not in practice possible, either for us as, in, as experimenting agents or for the natural processes of the world. And, and decoherence is that process by which even things much, much, much smaller than the billiard ball interact with many, 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 many degrees of freedom such that interference can't possibly be seen anymore by any plausible physical process. Uh, and, it, and it's that process um, that means that the world language makes sense. The world language makes sense when interference between the worlds won't happen. And the physical mechanism that means interference between the worlds won't happen is decoherence. And decoherence happens basically whenever something gets sufficiently good. 